Today is Thursday, February 9th, 2012, and our session is entitled The Power of Global Collaboration on Clinical Cases, How Social Media is Enabling Peer-to-Peer -peer Consultation Around the World. Uh, my name is Eric Laser, and I help lead physician engagement in social media here at Best Doctors, and we are really excited and fortunate to have a tremendous panel of physicians from from all over the world representing Spain, Hungary, and the U.S. who are going to provide you with anecdotes and insights around clinical consultation and how and why doctors are adopting social media to improve their diagnosis, uh, ability to diagnose and prescribe treatment. We'll also be tweeting today using the hashtag Best Doc. So if you're familiar with Twitter, you could follow along uh, using the hashtag Best Talk and tweet yourselves as well. Before I formally introduce our panelists, I want just to take a few minutes to briefly describe Best Doctors and, and what we do. We, we are not simply a list that you, that you read in a magazine. In fact, uh, we provide an important and popular benefit for large employers around the globe. So most folks may know us around the regional magazines that we get our lists published in. You may have a plaque of ours. But in fact, we were founded in 1989 by a couple of professors at Harvard Medical School for the purpose of providing clinical consultation. So our clients are Fortune 1000 companies, and they hire us to assist their employees in, in a number of areas. At a high level, I'll summarize, we, we assist their employees in identifying the very best doctor in a particular specialty or subspecialty, so we provide referrals to our best doctors. We also answer employees uh, of our clients' clinical questions, and we're best known for providing the employee with the right answers to questions associated with complex clinical cases. And, and this comprehensive review of, of a patient case we call our interconsultation, which is really a collaborative process that involves multiple physicians and complementary disciplines. So I'm going to try to give you a very quick example of how this all works, and I'm actually going to move to the virtual whiteboard. So if you're logged in, you're going to have the benefit of seeing some great artistic talent. And if you're, if you're just listening in, well, the truth is I'm off at this, so you're spared a lot of lines and circles. But l let, me give you, let me give you how this works. A client's uh, employee, who we call a member, uh, gives us a call. And let's say in this instance they're diagnosed with stage 1 lung cancer. We will have a specially trained nurse that we call a member advocate, or an MA, if you will, and they will take a really detailed clinical intake. And once the intake is complete, we'll have a uh, release form signed by, by, the, the, by the member. And then our medical records team gets to work. And they are experts at collecting the member's records from the disparate sources. <clears throat> Excuse me. We then have one of our doctors, an internist, take a look at all the medical records. Uh, this in internist is a practicing resident or fellow at a leading teaching hospital. We have about 90 of them, and they assimilate all the information and summarize the case in a written format. And we train them to be very good critical thinkers, and we ask our internists really not to necessarily look for answers, but really to think about asking the right questions. And another routine component of our process is we put the case through a pathology review. So in parallel, we have a pathologist and we, we partner with the Brigham and Women's Group to take a look at, at, at the path. And we then, we then take our, another team of nurses and they help match the case to a physician expert in our database. And that is our best doctor. That's you, or at least most of you who are on the call today. And we'll send you a clinical summary that our internist, we'll call it a CS for purposes of this little diagram, we'll send you a clinical summary written by our internist, and we'll also send you uh, a pathology report, and we'll ask you to write us a brief executive report answering the questions asked by our internist and reacting to the pathology report. And in doing so, you may provide recommendations for a diagnosis and treatment that is similar or exactly the same as with the treating physician, or maybe it's different. And we'll take this expert report and we're going to put it through a QA process that is driven by our own physician team. And then that completed report is summarized, 
So there's a summary in layman's terms. It's sent back to the nurse and then sent to our member, who's down here, a little stick figure I'll draw for you, and also shared with the treating physician, so the treating MD. And usually always that report is very warmly received by the treating physician, and we tend to have, get a very nice response. In this particular case that I'm thinking of, it was a lung cancer case, and the pathologist studied the slide and noticed that uh, the tumor was near blood vessels. The cells were uniformly organized, and the boundary between the cancer and normal lung tissue did not look typical of lung cancer. So the pathologist ran a specialized immunohistochemistry, and this stained positively for thyroid cancer, which was consistent with the patient's remote history, and that was identified during the long intake by, by our member advocate, by our nurse. So that's in short order what we do and, and, and how we do it. And in fact, uh, it gets even a little bit better than that. Uh, outside of the U.S., the Best Doctors also designs and implements healthcare insurance offerings. So together, we actually serve like 30 million members in over 40 countries. And we, we believe by focusing on right diagnosis and treatment and linking this to basic patient-centered medical expertise, we'll, we'll, we're going to be able to help transform healthcare forever. And of course, we do compensate our best doctors for providing, for providing our members with, with the insights and expertise that they do. So what we're trying to do to, during webinars like the one today is to tackle topics that are relevant to you around how clinicians can effectively utilize collaborative processes or tools to improve patient care. So very consistent with what we do on a daily basis. And in fact, this is only our second webinar for physicians by physicians. So our hope is that we're gonna provide you with these on a monthly basis and as such, about 10 minutes, 15 minutes to go, we're gonna put up a survey in front of you and ask you the favor of, of providing us with feedback and specifically what other topics you'd like us to cover. And our webinars will never be sponsored by pharmaceutical or medical device companies. We don't make money off them. Those are not our clients. So you have no concerns over that, uh, and they'll always be free for our best doctors. We are in listen-only mode, of course, but we, that doesn't mean we can't be interactive. I want this session to be as interactive as possible, so we're going to ask you some high-level questions uh, during the session. So if you're looking to sit on your hands and get a free ride, uh, you're out of luck. We're going to have questions in the bottom right. They're called polling questions. And I'm also going to encourage you to pepper our panelists with questions. You can ask them via WebEx, which is the Q&A box towards the right-hand margin of your screen. Or you, if you're daring and you're already out there in social media, please ask them via Twitter. We're, we're, we're monitoring the hashtag BestDoc. And I'm sure you're going to be hearing a little bit more about Twitter from our panelists. So I'm actually going to start with a question to all of you. How many of you are actually using Twitter? We'll put that poll up and we'll give you a minute or two to click yes or no and we'll share those responses with you. There's a, uh, a recent study from uh, Deloitte Consulting, which is a big global consulting firm, that talked about the tremendous value uh, that social media platforms are having on healthcare organizations' businesses, but they also have incredible value to physicians as providers of that, of that care. So to talk about how these physicians are actually incorporating social media into the profession, we've decided rather than ask consultants with fancy suits to join us, we'll bring together three tremendous physicians with fancy lab coats to join us. So let me introduce them to you now. Uh, from Madrid, Spain, I'd like to introduce to you Minia Campos. She is the head of pediatric dermatology at Gregorio Marañón Hospital in Madrid, Spain. She is also a professor of dermatology at Universidad Complutense de Madrid and received her MD from the Universidad Autonoma de Madrid, and she's very active in, in leveraging closed online community platforms to collaborate with peers on our cases. We're excited to have her here today, so welcome, Dr. Campos. Hello. Hello, welcome. Okay. Hello. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Hello? Uh, from yeah, I hear you. Uh, you are a little echoey, so you may want to get a little bit closer to your phone, Minya. 
From Boston, Massachusetts, let me introduce to you Dr. Gary Choi. He's a radiologist within the Division of Emergency Radiology and Teleradiology at Massachusetts General Hospital. He was educated at Albert, Albert Einstein College of Medicine and is also the founder of Rad Rounds, which is an online discussion forum with, get this, over 9,000 radiologists who are participating throughout the world. So we're excited to have Dr. Choi join us. Welcome. Thanks, Eric. Uh, great to be here. Looking forward to discussing social media and how physicians can better use this to collaborate uh, clinically and beyond. Terrific. And our th our third panelist is from Budapest, Hungary. I want to introduce to you Dr. Bercy Mesko. He graduated from the U University of Debrasson Medical School and Health Science Center and has now started a PhD in the field of personalized genomics. He's also the founder of Webacena, which is a free service that curates medical social media resources, and it's actually translated in like 17 languages. It's a terrific resource, and we'll talk probably a little bit more about how to get you started on social media and going to that website later on in our session. So I'm going to jump right into question one here, uh, a little personal background that's tied to question one. My second job at a, at a college, I had the privilege of working for a company called Physicians Online. And they were, if you will, an AOL for doctors back in the late 90s. And I remember clearly standing over the medical director's shoulder during my first week and seeing a case posted on this discussion form about this 17-year-old overweight girl with chest pain and shortness of breath. And the case was out of Iowa, and the treating physician had posted the vignette and was getting responses from all over the country. And it was unbelievable. I thought, wow, this 17-year-old's health is going to be profoundly changed by the advice that they're getting because of this thing called the Internet. So if you fast forward to 2012, our ability to communicate via digital platforms is vastly expanded. Uh, Thomas Friedman, uh, a well-known author, he likes saying the world is flat. So I'm going to start with you, Dr. Mesko, out in, in Hungary. Could you provide us with an example or two of how doctors are collaborating across borders, not just within the country, but across borders using social media? Absolutely. Good morning to everyone. Um, I've been using social media quite actively uh, since I was a first-year medical student. And years ago, back then, when I was a medical student, uh, we had a strange case at the clinic. Uh, my professors told me that they had a 16-year-old boy with uh, acute pancreatitis for the sixth time in his life. And they couldn't find a real solution for this problem. And that time, I, I was quite active on Twitter. Uh, I had thousands of followers, medical students, uh, physicians, professors, patients from all over the globe, and I thought I should ask them this question. What do you think about this case? Just a few details. 16-year-old boy with this condition, what do you think? I expected to get some answers, but uh, at the end of the day, I received over 200 replies from uh, physicians, patients, medical lawyers, medical librarians, students from around the world. They all tried to help. They tried to come up with the latest literature uh, to find a very specific cases and case studies and we discussed the whole case for one day's time. And at the end, we came up with one potential diagnosis, microlithiasis. And uh, I came up with this issue at the next day's grand round at the clinic. And some days ago, some days, days later, it turned out to be the diagnosis. So I've been using Twitter for crowdsourcing in medicine for many years now. But the, the reason why I can do this is that I've been building my community on Twitter for years. I know, the, I know those people, we have a relationship, we have trust, and uh, I, know, I know what, where they work and, and what they are working on, so we can, ask, we can ask clinical professional questions to each other and try to crowdsource the problem at the end. That's great. That's a terrific, terrific example. And I know, you know, with, with Rad Rounds, Dr. Choi, you're doing some of the same things. Could you give us a couple of uh, stories or at least one around uh, collaborating across borders? Yeah, sure. Um, I can I definitely echo what uh, Dr. Mesco also has experienced with the use of social media. Uh, in my own personal experience with uh, Rad Rounds, uh, which, as Eric uh, summarized, is a, is a community of radiologists. And one of the key features of Rad Rounds is the use of social media and the use of uh, sharing uh, cases and images where uh, if a radiologist posts an image, other radiologists within the community can view the image and also chime in. There are comments uh, that can be inputted into the website. And so, for example, one clinical case 
uh, an Italian radiologist came across a, a patient that basically started to have a, a very rapidly growing uh, bony uh, protuberance, which rapidly progressed throughout the rest of the skull, and he was not really sure exactly what the case was, although his leading differential diagnosis was fibrous dysplasia. And this uh, Italian radiologist sent the axial images as well as a 3D reformation of the case onto rad rounds, and he was able to get uh, 6,400 views uh, from around the world, uh, and specifically about 30 radiologists from multiple specialties, including neuroradiology, musculoskeletal radiology, to really chime in and really narrow down the differential diagnosis, uh, ranging from uh, osteosarcoma to uh, you know genetic uh, malformation versus a uh, fibrous dysplasia, and, and in the end, using rad rounds and social media, the, the uh, differential uh, that most radiologists from around the world outsourced uh, you know, led the Italian radiologists to really um, you know, believe in the diagnosis of fibrous dysplasia, and that's what the case turned out to be. That's 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 awesome. Uh, great, great examples. Thank you. Uh, I just want to remind everyone, and we see some questions already coming in, the Q&A module to your right or Twitter using the hashtag BestDoc. Uh, you could start uh, peppering us with questions. I'm going to move on to our next question. I, I think, you know, it stands to reason that doctors are using social media, at least for personal reasons. So my my thesis is as they use it more and more personally, they're going to they're going to start using it more professionally. So uh, I guess, Dr. Campos, I'm going to ask you, you know, if you agree with that statement and how you, you know, do you see an increase of, in the use of social media by doctors or do you feel like they're going to avoid it? I think we doctors are using social networks more and more these days. This is something in my country, in Spain, this is happening just now, right now. Our Spanish Journal of Dermatology just uh, the the Facebook page opened this week, so this is happening right now. And my colleagues in the 30s and 40s, they are all opening blogs, medical blogs, dermatology blogs uh, to communicate. So I think this is something happening now. It's standing all around the world, and it's so exciting for us and for the medical community. So I will avoid social media. Media. We love social media. <laughs> yeah. It'd be interesting if we if we did a survey and we we polled doctors in in Europe versus doctors in the U.S. I'm guessing we'll get a little bit of a of, of a different level of enthusiasm, I would say. But you know, in my experience, like I said, at Physicians Online, I do think that the power of collaboration is is profound and and how it could help patients. And I I know two of the more interesting books that I've read that everyone on the call may be familiar with. Uh, One's called Wisdom of Crowds by Jim Sawicki and the other's Jerry Groupman's How Doctors Think. Uh, I I think they're both very interesting and apropos for a call like this because in Wisdom of Crowds, the author cites studies that show that a group, when it's in the right environment and when it's facilitated correctly, is smarter than the smartest individual in that group. And when you combine that with the thesis uh, by Dr. Groupman, which demonstrates that medical diagnosis is so often dependent on human nature and a physician being a good critical thinker, uh, I think that the Internet is sort of perfect to combine the powers of both those uh, theses. I know, I know here at Best Doctors our process is really designed to tap into that wisdom and produce an environment where experts can support experts in providing a detailed analysis of a complex clinical case. So call it group think or critical group think if you want. How do we think that physicians can improve medical collaboration using these communities? And I'll start with you, Dr. Choi. Uh, I can give another example. Basically, one of the other um, initiatives that I've been involved with is uh, International Radiology Exchange, which is a, a group of, which was formed by a group of radiologists as a nonprofit group uh, to do pro bono teleradiology. And so this has only been re- uh, possible recently because of the latest developments on in, uh, social media, uh, specifically uh, digital communication. Um, so the way that we do teleradiology is that we can't afford to have for pro bono work uh, to buy a multi-million dollar tax system with transmission systems. So there are a lot of actually low-cost and free uh, communication technologies that we have used to get cases from abroad and send the cases over here. For example, we serve a hospital uh, uh, in Rwanda uh, that is run jointly with the government and Partners in Health. 
and a lot of American physicians volunteer and travel to Rwanda, and they come across a lot of uh, interesting and perplexing radiology cases. So our group, International Radiology Exchange, is always available to look at cases. Um, one case that was uh, recently uh, available uh, that, that they needed help on is uh, CT abdomen of a patient uh, which got to have a malignancy. And the way that they actually sent the case over is that they wanted a pediatric uh, radiologist to look at this. And our hospital has um, you know, five specialists that actually uh, volunteer and really want to get involved, and they, they love social media. And the way that we uh, sent the case over is using Google Picasa. So first they anonymized the case, and they put the entire image stack onto Picasa. And the, the beauty of Picasa is that you can actually scroll through the images, and there's a comment section, a place where um, any, anyone you give permission to the folder can, can comment on. Basically what happened was the American physicians abroad sent the link over. We just clicked on the link, and the group of pediatric radiologists were able to chime in and add their, uh, their interpretation, their read, on that case. And to take it one step further is now Google Picasso is actually linked to Google Plus accounts as well as other social media uh, plugins that you can actually uh, you know, get on to Google Picasso, Google Plus using other other means as well. You can have the desktop application. You can have the web-based application. And so this really helps our workflow uh, while also provides value across the social media really allows for us to do pro bono teleradiology uh, and leverage the uh, power of specialists over here communicated to uh, physicians abroad all the way around the world in Africa. That's great. That's a great example. I, what, what about what about you, Dr. Campos? How do you feel about how we how physicians can improve their or their examples of how they can improve their ability to to collaborate, leveraging these communities? Okay. In our hospital, we have a great experience with a uh, with a um, social professional social network called Netting. It's great for our hospital, but also we communicate with people uh, uh, around the world. For example, in tropical disease, tropical disease is, uh, has a lot of dermatologic disease also, and we we have a lot of immigrants from Brazil, from Colombia, from Equator, from Venezuela, and we we are, many times we don't know uh, there are strange things, strange infections, and we need their help from people from from doctors there. So I actually so, I actually just Dr. Campos, I gave you the if you want to share your desktop, okay. I don't know. If you, Okay, if you want to see, uh, this is just yes, to see one quick look at our, our. You still there? Uh, yes. Uh, sorry. Um, is it up on the top tab there? Uh, sorry. This oh, is just so. an example, right? This is an example of the this online community. This is just community. an example yeah, of our right. online community where we see the cases, where we see. Can you expand your screen? Yes, I'm trying to. Yes. So this is our online community, and it's great because we can see all these thermoscopy images from the patient and share it with the radiologist, the oncologist, etc. from this melanoma, for example. And this is great, and we can make comments and just a quick look at it. It's very interesting, and it's great, and we have lots of groups. But I was talking about the tropical disease and all the teledermatology projects, and there are lots of teledermatology projects with Africa with uh, cellular cell phone images, with, with Picasso images too, and, and it's very helpful, and it's uh, yeah, cost-effective, it's validated. There are lots of papers on that and with teledermatology projects on there. They are very, very interesting, and and they are helpful, and and, they, and that works. So it's 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 thrilling for us, for dermatologists, because it's an image-based specialty, and 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 this is very helpful. So tropical disease and and Africa and cooperation, yeah. That's great, and I know I know, I'm Dr. Choi being being based on 
image image diagnosing as well. And I know your your wife's also a dermatologist, so I'm, and I'm sure you'll reference in some cases some of her experiences using the the internet as well. I I know it's ripe for that. I, I want to just move on quickly to the next question. Of course, it's related. There was you know a study by the American Medical News that said that over like 25% of the doctors who they polled collaborated with peers as a result of their information searches online. So I, I guess I want to learn a little bit more about what you guys think are the disease areas where there's the most potential for global collaboration. So I'll, I'll start with you, Dr. Mesco. Uh, years ago when I started to write my blog in which I talked about how uh, social media could be used in medicine and healthcare, I started receiving emails from patients and medical professionals from around the world. They tried to find relevant resources focusing on their own medical condition or specialty. So that's why we created mm -hmm. webbyseen.com years ago, uh, on which we curate the medical resources of social media. It means that, just to give you an example, that manually, with the help of uh, medical professionals and e-patients worldwide, we mm -hmm. select the most relevant quality cardiology blogs, cardiology Twitter users, video channels, and so on, all the social media resources manually. And then um, uh, we had a story, story contest in which we asked e-patients and professionals to share the stories in which they describe how social media helped them in medicine and healthcare. And uh, this story contest was won by um, an e-patient, Catherine Leon, who described her story on her own blog. Uh, the, the depth of social media, and um, she had um, postpartum spontaneous coronary artery dissection, SCAD in short, and also heart attack. And it's quite a rare condition, but she started to write a blog about this after the, after the situation, and uh, she was quite open about her condition. She tried to find patients dealing with the same problems on different networks. She tried to connect all of these patients and, uh, and discuss this problem, discuss the symptoms, and try to raise awareness about this uh, rare condition. So I would say that in a few years' time, all the conditions, even the rare ones, um, will be covered, and um, even a rare condition would become very visible by having these e-patient um, um, voice, voices, online voices, who talk about these conditions on blogs, on Facebook, on Twitter, on, on uh, global networks. So these patients are quite active online. We just have to listen to them and find ways to, to help them get to the really reliable, medically accurate information and resources they are looking for. That's great. So, Dr. Mesco, we're getting a bunch of questions, by the way, that are coming in. And um, I think every single one of them could be, could be thrown in into this conversation. Which networks, doctor networks, is the group on the, on the call right now, are you using Sermo, Medscape, are there others, or are you just using closed communities? Dr. Mesko? I, I myself, I prefer using European networks. I'm based in Hungary, but um, I really like uh, Osmosis, on which uh, trust network approach is developed, and I also like Medscape. These are the two um, U.S.-based communities I'm a member of. Great. Right. And, and as far as, you know, Dr. Campos, how, how, what's your take on sort of on, on where the disease areas, what disease areas have the most most potential? I agree with Dr. Mesco that rare diseases are rare diseases in every specialty. And this, uh, this uh, social network, this communication has changed the, the way rare diseases. We can now talk with a genetician in Finland and, and, and we can contact the, uh, uh, a family, uh, a doctor who studied a family in Australia. So that's great for rare diseases. And we are exchanging photos and exchanging clinical cases from, from our uh, rare disease patient uh, around the world, and we are doing it right now. And also for the multidisciplinary areas like oncology uh, and vascular anomalies also, uh, this is areas in which uh, uh, we need an oncologist, we need a, a radiotherapist, we need a radiologist, we need a surgeon. So this, this is multidisciplinary areas are, are also uh, the, the most, have the most potential for global collaboration, I think. So one of our audience members is asking, you know, is there an interpretation service 
or an accepted universal language used in these endeavors? And I'll, you know, I'll open it up to the panel. I'll start with you, Dr. Campos, but feel free, Dr. Choi and Dr. Mesco, to jump in. Dr. Campos? Language, language, the international language for... Yeah, for well, is there an, the, 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 the question English. is, is there an interpretation service or is there an accepted universal language used in these global endeavors that you're referencing? The, you know, the language, the most used language is English. It's now the medical language. So, so English. <laughs> um, um, uh, yes, I think. Uh, now we all doctors have to learn English in order to to be on in the world right now in order to communicate and to help our patients. So that's my. Okay. What about Dr. Dr. Masco? Do you feel the same way? Is it mostly English? Are there there are? You, do you see the emergence of a of an industry that's actually effectively interpreting uh, some of the clinical talk based on SNOMED or something like that or? In an uh, optimal world, we would have very strong collaborators in, in all countries, and we could talk about these cases in that specific language. But of course, right now, we have collaborators from around the world, but we don't have strong networks in each country, so we have to talk in English. But I, uh, to be honest, I understand why this question is asked, and uh, maybe it's important to mention that compared to the health information technology solutions, social media is a bit different. I mean, social media solutions are a bit different. For example, for me to be able to use Twitter for medical crowdsourcing, it took me years to build that network in which I can ask questions, clinical questions, and in which I know that I will get clinically relevant answers from people who I trust, uh, who I know personally. I know where they work, in which hospitals and so on. So we have some kind of a relationship professionally. And, uh, but for this, it took me years to build that network. In, in the um, uh, normal, uh, HIT solutions, people get a new software, a new service, and they can use that right away. Social media is different. Interesting. Dr. Choi, do you have any take on this? What's going on at Rad Rounds? Yeah, I, I agree with um, with the Percy and Dr. Campbell said, you know, the, the English is really the most commonly used uh, language. Um, although I've seen, if you go on Rad Rounds, you can see actually multiple languages uh, between doctors from the same region. So, uh, for example, uh, doctors in India, uh, you'll see that they're they're typing in their own language, as well as uh, you know Spanish uh, from you know doctors from uh, South America, Spain. Uh, so it's interesting, but the majority is English, and I agree that the power of the network really increases by the square of the number of members. So there's actually a law out there, and somebody did some uh, some work on this to look at this, and so so it's a good time to start in social media. It's really start to build your network. Uh, at first, Rad Rounds was a few years ago, 50 radiologists, and it was still useful for the 50, but now uh, we have over 9,500, and, and uh, the user, the, the number of interactions has really grown uh, exponentially by the, by the growth. So the more people you have in your network, the much more valuable that network uh, becomes. Great. So, uh, we're, of course, we're getting we're getting in. We're getting a bunch of questions on the on the the legalese things, and I I actually I actually thought should we have an attorney on this panel, and I I actually said I decided the last minute no, but here they are. They're coming. They're pouring in. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a question out there. This is a little bit off script. We're gonna talk a little bit about HIPAA because a bunch of these questions are coming in around HIPAA, specifically obviously coming in from U.S. physicians. But you know, what's HIPAA's impact on this kind of form of communication? I don't know if Dr. Dr. Choi, I'm going to throw that at you. I know it's a little bit unscripted here. Then we'll go over to, to Dr. Mesco and see if, if there's their opinion on privacy in general, and then I'll, I'll move it over to Dr. Campos. Yeah, it's uh, a great question. About uh, the legal risk. Yeah, uh, in our hospital, in our social network, as professional network, uh, we are we are advised about just making private groups with no names, with no faces, with peer-to-peer -peer consults in order to minimize the legal risk. Uh, we have uh, to label our cases as private, and uh, we have to avoid any name or any tattoo or any recognizable uh, feature from the patient. So that's what they say to us and what we do. Okay. Um, yeah. 
And just to remind everyone on the call, there's there's a poll up. I think it's being labeled as poll number eight. Would love your insights on this as well, everyone on the call. Uh, and it, it basically asks you the same question: Are you are you worried about the possible legal issues in collaborating online? But Dr. Choi, go ahead. Uh, why don't you jump right in? Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, it's a very important question because we are physicians and we have the. It's our duty to really protect the privacy and uh, clinical data of our patients. And so it's important you follow the same rules that you would uh, normally uh, when you're in a public forum, at a conference, uh, because in, in the world of social media, you know, you have the, the power to, your message really can go out there into the public uh, as well as, um, you know, so, so the information can be spread very quickly as well. And so it's important to not use any patient identifiers, their names, medical record numbers, or very unique um, clinical data that really can allow anyone to identify uh, the topic or person that you're talking about. And so uh, it's a, in our work with uh, pro bono teleradiology, we anonymize the cases. We make sure we delete the cases that are on Picasa. Uh, we really try to try to create as zero of a footprint as possible in terms of um, public information. Um, and so to that point, we also have an intranet, uh, a closed community, um, and that speaks to the power of various uh, closed communities which protect privacy and really try to have secure data. And those, those are the kind of networks you might want to try first. Uh, so it's, uh, it is important uh, to, to really protect patient privacy. That's great. What about Dr. Mesco? Do you have anything to add, or are you on point with I everything? I absolutely agree. Uh, even if the HIPAA is a... Um, is a law enacted in the U.S. I always tell my medical students that whatever medical content you publish online, you should keep these 18 identifiers in mind. So then, so then you know what kind of content you cannot and shouldn't publish about your patients. But there's a very good question from the audience about legal responsibility, and I must mention here that when I when I ask the, ask clinical questions in my social media channels, I don't expect my colleagues from the U.S. or the U.K. to solve my problem, but I want to discuss a case. But in these situations, we do not discuss a case of a specific patient, but we discuss medical cases without any specific details related to the patient. That's a, that's a huge difference. So at least in Europe, there is no legal responsibility uh, regarding these issues. Okay. And, and, and actually, there's a cut just to... Just to tidy up the legal conversation here, there was a, a question specifically around the best doctor's process, which right now is not in a social uh, network or social media environment, but uh, I did want to address it because it's also a similar, similar type of uh, type of process where someone's asking you for a consultation. And uh, the answer is we, we're, we're happy to report that in over 15 years, we haven't, uh, in thousands of cases, we've never been sued on uh, on our work, and the reason for that is we don't have a doctor-patient relationship with the members who have access to the services. You know, so that's one of the first things that we tell our tell our members is neither we nor the doctor uh, that we retain and review the case is the member's physician. So that that's important. And then we we never. Uh, provide medical treatment to any of our members either. So uh, anyone that has more questions about that, I could dive into it at another time. But th those are sort of the high level reasons why we sort of have fallen into an unofficial, I'll say unofficial safe harbor, and we just don't have any issues as it relates to that. So uh, let, let's move off uh, the legal topic. Keep the questions coming in, by the way. Uh, we, 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 I'm going to continue monitoring them, and we'll, 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 we'll jump into some more questions as they, as they appear. But let's talk a little bit about the patient now. I mean, the physicians, how can physicians use social media to better communicate with their patient? We have examples here of two of our best doctors who are become using video as a mechanism to, to connect with their patients, get their patients more familiar with who they are, and answer frequently asked questions that may lessen the, the call load on their office. Uh, how, how is the panel thinking about how physicians can use social media to improve their communication and relationship with the with the patient. I'll start with you, Dr. Choi. Uh, yeah, so I'll give one example of uh, what my my wife, who is a dermatologist, has started to use social media for. She has uh, created a a blog as well as a website which uh, discusses the most common um, dermatology conditions. And you know, Dr. Campos has already done a lot of work in dermatology as well, so. 
I'm sure there could be a connection there. And, and basically, um, a lot of patients, a lot of her patients ha- ask her the same questions. Uh, so what she has done is cre- created a, a FAQ, a Frequently Asked Questions resource, uh, where she posts her answers with images. And she's hoping to go into video, actually, where she can explain um, the disease entity or post-treatment plan. And so what she does is asks the patient if they're interested, if they want an email summary of post-treatment plan or a little bit more about the condition that they're diagnosed with. And so what she does is then type in the email address into her website, and the patient gets a link when they go home. Um, if they get this information, and the patients love it. Plus, it also helps her with her clinical workflow. She gets one less phone call. Um, you know, colleagues get less phone call. The on-call physician gets a, one less phone call. Um, although it cannot solve all the, you know, workflow issues, it does improve uh, uh, quality of service, patient satisfaction, and basic quality of care. And so that's how she uses uh, social media to improve the communication and relationship with her patients. Fascinating. What about Dr. Mesco? What's your what's your experience and what's your advice to the physicians on the on the call today regarding ways to improve communication with the patient? I see many cases at the clinic when the patients have questions related to the internet. They want to find a diabetic patient. Want to find a blogs written about diabetes. Only reliable quality medical blogs. And she did a search in Google and she found hundreds of blogs and many of them were spams or advertisement-based blogs. So she had a problem finding good resources. So my suggestion is, first, I have a course at the university in which I I teach medical students about using social media for medical purposes. And I always tell them that you should be able to assess the quality of medical websites now, not by doing Google searches, but by uh, getting the skills to assess the quality of medical websites. When a patient asks such information, you should be able to find and know the best quality, reliable medical resources, online resources, focusing on your specialty or the condition that you're interested in. So uh, I believe that digital literacy such should be included in the medical curriculum. That's why it's part of the university program right now at my medical school. Very interesting. Uh, I know, you know, I know, and this is one of the questions we're going to ask you in just a few minutes. We're going to put up a feedback form and allow you to not only uh, to, to both, um, if you want to request a, you get a copy of the slide sent to you. You could also request a, a copy of one of Best Doctors' ex, ex, executive uh, reports that I explained about to be sent to you, but also you could provide us with insights on what topics you want to cover at our next webinars. We'll also ask you if if you're interested in being part of our video program, because we do want to get some of our experts up there through video answering questions, frequently asked questions of patients within their disease area and specialty and where their area of expertise is. So that will be asked of you in just a a few moments. We're going to to move on to – we'll have a few more minutes left. We're going to move on to our our final couple of questions. I, I know a lot of uh, physicians on the call right now aren't really heavily involved in social media, but they want to learn you know, what they should do to start. They're curious. So l- let's have the group talk a little bit about how physicians can get started in social media. And I, I we put together a, a few physicians on Twitter that you could follow. This is just a snapshot. There are, I think I follow over 300 doctors, and if you want to reach out to me personally, I could try to share with you that those, those names. I know Dr. Mesco has a huge list, bigger than mine, uh, and there's also a number of different uh, universities out there that are very interested to follow as well. But Let's talk a little bit, not just about Twitter, but in general. How can physicians get started with social media? And I'll, I'll start with you, Dr. Mesco, since uh, you've got the website and you've been you've been teaching this for a long time. Yeah, that's a very important question. Um, I'm pretty sure that if someone, if a medical professional wants to have a real social media presence and wants to be involved in in global collaboration efforts in social media, then first they should have a strategy or at least first they should listen to those doctors who are already in social media in their own field of interest. So I would like to to discuss um, a story about a friend of mine. He's an ear, nose, throat specialist in Budapest. He has a a private um, clinic, a real medical practice, and um, he saw one of my presentations about three years ago. And then he decided to, to build a social media presence. So he started using all these social media channels, YouTube, 
Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Dig, really all of these, but he had a strategy. He used these for six months, then he stopped, did an evaluation, and he kept on using only three tools. So now it means that this uh, you know, sort specialist has a blog in Hungarian language. It means that in a, if a patient does, does a search for you know, throat symptoms in Hungarian language, they will find his blog in the first place. That's one of the best resources about these conditions online. Second, he had a Twitter account in English to keep himself up to date, to be able to discuss cases with colleagues from around the world, to be able to ask clinical questions in English and to find the latest literature in his field of interest. And third, he has a Facebook page, a fan page for the clinic, for the practice itself. And a few weeks ago, he told me that now 50% of his patients find him through these social media resources. It takes him about 30, 40 minutes a day to update these, uh, the Twitter channel, the Facebook page, and the, and the blog. But now 50%, 50 of his new patients find him through these resources. And he also told me that when, when he meets these patients who come from these social media channels, they have some kind of a relationship even before the first personal meeting because the patients could find relevant, reliable information about their condition in, on his blog, on his Facebook page, or by using his uh, Twitter account. So they can, they can actually build a relationship even before the first meeting. And these patients keep on using social media channels, his channels, even after the first visit, and they, and they keep in touch. So I believe that if, if someone has a strategy and design this, this social media presence with not that much work, they can build a quite a successful uh, presence, not just for their own practices or, or hospitals, but also for themselves to be able to, to participate in um, clinical consultations and collaborations worldwide through social media. That's a great, great example. I hope that was uh, helpful. And, and, and folks, when you do... When you do give us recommendations on webinar topics, if you want to have a social media one-on-one -on -one, or even we could limit it to maybe a dozen doctors and have a two-way dialogue and we could run maybe even a, a course for you, uh, we'd be happy to consider doing that if that's something that the group here is, is interested in learning more about. So, Dr. Choi, w what's your take on how to help doctors get started? Yeah, um, so my take is uh, basically just dive in. There's a lot of websites out there, and um, one thing you could try is uh, just sign, sign up for a Twitter account, uh, sign up for a Facebook account, as well as LinkedIn. And these have that value regardless. Uh, you can communicate with your family to begin with. But uh, you can also start to uh, use social media, uh, for example, using Twitter, to uh, follow uh, medical journals, follow other physicians. And that's one way to discover what's going on in real time on the Internet in your field. Um, find out, you know, let's say you're in surgery, find out uh, which other surgeons are on Twitter. I know uh, the chairman of surgery uh, at the uh, University of Chicago is on Twitter. Um, he puts out a lot of great posts on what he thinks are the most interesting uh, news articles that comes out. And so you could always follow him. Uh, there are other uh, positions online. So once you get started, you'll get a better sense of how you can use social media and then tailor it to what you want to get out of it. Um, so from there, uh, you can start to blog, start to use YouTube, create videos, uh, and uh, as we discussed, there are many uh, physician-centric uh, networks which are closed and open, so try to join some of those. Uh, I, I just uh, posted some of the examples out there, and such as Thermo, Osmosis, um, those are general medical networks, but there are niche networks, uh, such as the one um, that we started at Rad Rounds for radiologists, but there are other ones for cardiologists and uh, so forth. Um, so really try to get involved. And one more or less uh, website that you should refer to is uh, the one Bursi started is uh, uh, Webacena. And so you could, from there you could actually look at all the resources out there for physicians. And so that's a good place to start. Terrific. You keep the questions coming, everyone. Uh, what, what, uh, let, let me actually quick transition. So I know, Bursi, you're going to be speaking at a conference called Doctors 2.0 and You. And it's May 23rd and 24th in Paris. We know the organizers of this event. It's probably a little far for everyone to go, but if you want an excuse to go to Europe, we've arranged with them that you can uh, get $100 off just by being a best doctor off the registration fee. So you go to doctors2o.com, 
go to register and you could type in the, the best doctors 12 uh, code and save yourself 100 bucks off registration. Again, if you want an excuse to go to Paris, figured I'd, I'd mention that because I know uh, Dr. Mesco is going to be speaking at it. But what 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 if I was to ask all three folks on the panel? I'll start with you, Dr. Campos. What is one? If I had to say, let's let's advise our audience on just one platform to start with. What would it be and why? Uh. I recommend our messaging platform, but I know it's not uh, accessible or available at every hospital, but it's great, our messaging platform. I, it's just great, but I think I, I don't have experience with other platforms. I'm sorry. In Netscape sure. or, or Twitter, I think. So, so if, I could, if, I could, uh, if I could put it another way, your, your real positive experience has been with these a social networking platform for a clinical collaboration within the hospital setting is really where you've seen yeah, the greatest value. That's what, yeah, yeah, that's where where I have my my greatest experience. So I really cannot uh, don't have sure. experience in other platforms. But, but that, 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 that platform, though, enables you to be collaborating with not only doctors within the walls of your hospital, but also outside with those global collaborations that you were referencing, correct? There's, there's opportunities to... Yes, yes. Okay. Difficult. Yeah. Well, what about you, Dr. Choi? Give the one platform that we need to tell tell the attendees today. Okay. Um, that's a good question. There's so many to choose from. One platform, which I think um, is a good one to start with. Uh, is for, for collaboration on clinical cases. I would say uh, CERMO is a good one. I, I do I, I do like how on CERMO it's a closed community and um, you're able to meet physicians from other specialties. And the network's pretty large. There's about, I don't know how many they have now, but 50,000 plus of physicians signed up. And uh, they have uh, image sharing capabilities. So if you have an image, you can always attach it to your post. It's built to... Do, to facilitate Q and A, so questions and answers. That's where you can get to interact with other physicians on clinical cases. I would start there, and uh, and then from there you can try other ones. Terrific. And, and Dr. Mesco, before I give you the the mic to, to also provide your input on this, I'm going to ask if we could throw up another polling question. So this is my, to my team on the fly. I'd love to know from our best doctors if they'd be interested in working on our cases within a closed social network. So I guess the question would read, would you be interested in working within a closed best doctor social network? If you could throw that question up there, Amy, I'd love to hear how everyone, uh, what their feedback is. Uh, Dr. Vesco, wh what do you think? I mean, well, what's, what's the one platform? And, and is, I'll actually, I'll give you one out here and I'll let you have two answers if there's a different answer for doctors overseas versus doctors in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, if I have to come up with only one platform, then uh, if someone wants to get a picture about how social media works from the collaborative um, point of view, I would say Twitter still. Even if it takes some time to find those colleagues you want to follow and, and vice versa, it's still, I, best, I think, the best solution for, for rapid, fast um, conversations, discussions, easy sharing of uh, medical papers, and you can get fast feedback. So I believe that if it should be the first platform, then it's Twitter. Tremendous. I'm also going to ask everyone, I'm going to put up this feedback form up here. I appreciate you guys asking, answering the polling question. Uh, this is everyone on the call's opportunity to provide us with insights so that we could do a better job next time. We could cover topics that are uh, important to you uh, as we want to continue to do this uh, for you on a monthly basis. Uh, I'm going to uh, get ready, sort of final thoughts. Uh, and close the meeting here because we want to be we want to be sensitive to everyone's schedule and and, and end on time. And, and speaking of time, I'd like everyone because I, I know this is going to come up. I don't have time for social media. This is the, what, what's in it for me, or how do you make the time? So I'd love to provide off the cuff one or two reasons why all of you are taking the time to go 
engage in a digital platform and work with other doctors uh, in a social media setting, whether it be within a hospital setting like Dr. Campos, whether it be on Twitter like Dr. Mesco, uh, Rad Rounds. I'd love to hear some advice on, on how to make the time and why it's worthwhile. So I'll start with you, Dr. Campos. So, Dr. Campos, uh, oh. uh, hello. Yes, I don't think I don't need more time for social media because I save time with social media. I have, I avoid, I don't have to speak to the radiologist in in the <laughs> in the lift or 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 in the uh, or go to the to the to the radiology department. I can, I can uh, speak on the on the social network. So I I save time with the social uh, media. I don't think I I need more time for the social media. So if if I could if I could say that a different way, it sounds like the the social networks within your hospital have become so integrated into the clinical uh, the regular daily routine around your clinical cases that it t takes no extra time. Is that what you're saying? No extra time. We save time thanks to the social media, to the social network. So they're great for our job. We save time and we can also work online, work from home. So it's good for us. So it helps us. It helps our daily job. Okay. And what about Dr. Choi? What, what, what would you say? I would say um, basically one of the things is it does save time. Like to discover when you use social media, you use it to discover the latest and greatest in medicine, what's going on in terms of news, journal articles. So using Twitter, for example, is a great way to uh, to benefit from the wisdom of the crowd to filter what's the most important from your colleagues' positions. So that saves time. At the same time, it's also a, it, it can improve your clinical workflow. If you have a tough case, you could actually um, get, uh, share it with some colleagues, get their opinion. It'll save you time. Um, also, decrease the stress on on your uh, daily comp competing interests and competing uh, cases that you're working on. And that use social media to really try to make your your life better. Your your professional and it will benefit your personal life as well uh, in that you'll improve communication, perhaps uh, if you use Facebook with your family, but you could also use social media in your, in your professional life where it can really, uh, you'll find that it won't take that much time at all. But it does take time to get started, to get educated, uh, because we are all pretty busy. But once you get going, you'll, you'll start to realize that it becomes uh, you know, part of your, your daily routine and uh, it'll benefit you uh, if you tailor it in the right way to your daily workflow. Great. And Dr. Mesco? Um, I would like to turn this question around. Uh, I'm pretty <laughs> sure that I would lose time if I didn't use the tools of social media. It would take me much more time to keep myself up to date. It would take me more time to, to find a, uh, a solution when I have a clinical question, a specific clinical question. It would take me more time to, to find those resources I'm looking for. So by using social media, I save time every day. I'm pretty sure about that. By having a, um, a Twitter account, a popular Twitter account, it takes me five minutes a day to update these. To have a blog, uh, I have an internationally uh, evolving medical blog, it takes me about 10 minutes a day to update that blog. So when you, when you become proficient at using these tools, it will save you time each and every day. Right. Yeah. I, I well, I'm gonna as a, as a I'm not a doctor. I pretend to be one every day and to get called on it. But I certainly think that the amount of information and insights that we learn over here on this end of best doctors through social media and Twitter specifically is remarkable. So we're, we're just about at uh, half past. And again, I want to be sensitive to everyone's time. I, I, I want to thank. My entire uh, panel, you guys were terrific. Thanks so much for taking the time, different uh, parts of the world, different times of your day. So th thank you very much for, for the effort. I want to uh, thank uh, the production team here at Best Doctors, Kelly Slimp, Amy Robinson, for all their hard work. And thank you all, uh, our attendees, many of you who are our Best Doctors, for, for joining us today. We're going to leave the survey up. I, if you want to request, again, an example of an expert report, you want some slides, you want, we have some slides that we didn't present with some data around utilization. We could even put the polling results that you've been so gracious in completing. We could include those as well, uh, de-identified, of course. So if you want to request all that, certainly just 
take the three or four minute survey, it's all multiple choice, and we'll, we'll get those out to you in the next couple of days. We'll also alert your colleagues to the fact that the recording will be available in about 24 hours. So uh, this will mark the end of our call. Thank you again, everyone, for participating. We look forward to seeing you here on a monthly basis. Take care now. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, great invitation. It has been it has been a great time. Uh, I I really enjoy this time um, our interchanging our experiences. Thanks, Mimi. I really appreciate it. We'll be in touch. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you.